How many? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay. In that case, um, this is a difficult uh, subject to speak on, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, because this is uh, no confidence against the speaker. The speaker is uh, supposed to be the... You can get more time also. No? Okay, right. Thank you. In that case, I will uh, change my start. I have here the determination of the Supreme Court of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka. The case is in the matter of an application under the terms of Article 126, read with Article 17 of the Constitution of the Democratic Socialist Republic. Vehera Gedara Ranjit Sumangala, number 137, upon two Beliatha Villa Kindal Pitya Millava versus Bandara Police Officer Police Station Mirihana Inspector Bhatia Jasinga OIC Mirihana Egodavale Chief Inspector Headquarters Inspector Mirihana uh, WMD Tennakon SP Nugegoda Division Office of the SP Nugegoda Mahinda Balasuri, Inspector General of Police, the Honorable Attorney General. Now, this is a case in which the fifth respondent, WMD Tennakon, also known as Desabandhu Tennakon, was found guilty of torture. And it says in this uh, facts presented, and this is the determination by the Supreme Court, uh, written by uh, by uh, Kumudani Vikramasinghe, uh, Priyanta Fernando, uh, and others. Uh, and uh, S. Turei Raja, who is given this uh, ruling. The issue is how a man was tortured. The man was hung upside down in certain times in the police station. And at some other times, balm applied on his private parts. Another time, a forced to inhale chili powder uh, that was inserted into a plastic bag and tied around his neck, etc. Now in this case, this is what the judge says with, with regard to Mr. Deshabandhu Tenakon. With regards to the fifth respondent, it is clear from paragraph 22, 23, 24 and 25 of the aforementioned affidavit of Nimal Pereira dated 8 June 2011, produced Mark P12, he then the superintendent of of police has paid a visit to the place where the petitioner and several others were detained on 17 December 2010. The affidavit further states that the fifth respondent himself, that is referring to WMD Tennakon, beat the petitioner with a three-wheel rubber band after stripping him naked and ordering him to rub uh, a balm. I don't want to mention the name because apparently, you know, people associate the brand name with this and the brand name has nothing to do with it. So I will leave the brand name aside. Balm on his genitalia. The fifth respondent is specifically referred to therein by his name and rank as it was then. The counter affidavit of the petitioner along with the aforementioned affidavits marked P10, P11 and P12 was filed before this court on 2nd March 2012. Written submissions of the first, second and fourth respondents was filed on 19 November 2013, almost 20 months later, Mr. Chairman. Even at that point, nothing was filed on behalf of the fifth respondent. You see, I'm reiterating this fact. Even 20 months later, 
Nothing was filed on behalf of the fifth respondent. In the interest of justice, on the 19th of May 2020, the court directed the registrar to serve notices on the third and fifth respondents, informing them of the next date of hearing. The notice sent to the fifth respondent was not returned. Written submissions of the Attorney General on behalf of the fifth and sixth respondents was filed on the 26th of September 2023. As can be seen, the respondents of the instant case were affordable ample opportunities to plead their cases before this court. Upon direction by court, the fifth respondent to file affidavit dated 5th October 2023. The said affidavit only related to the Code of Criminal Procedure, Special Provisions Act. The fifth respondent, represented by the Attorney General, has not at any point during the proceedings rejected or objected to the allegations against him herein, herein before set out. Therefore, I find the fifth respondent to have tortured the petitioner in violation of his fundamental rights guaranteed under Article 11 of the Constitution. For this very reason and by the very fact, I find the fifth respondent to have further violated the petitioner's right under Article 12, Subsection 1 of the Constitution. It is also revealed by the minute on the document mark RX1, the first, second, and fourth respondent statements of objections and the excerpts from the court Hadisi Amatu Manse Dainikava Pavatwa Genu and Labana Hadisi Amatum Toruturu Pata Unquote and next there to Mark Rx two and the fifth respondent himself ordered the investigation and that he has had intimate knowledge of the investigation. With regards to the violation of Articles 13.1 and 13.2 of the Constitution, from the aforementioned facts, it is clear that the fifth respondent had knowledge of the petitioner's detention on account of his visit on 17 December 2010 for a brief session of torture. I am not saying this. This is the Supreme Court of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka. The fifth respondent had received the anonymous complaint describing the involvement of the petitioner and three others by name only five days before the arrest. And when the fifth respondent arrived at the torture chamber on the 17th December 2010, so the Supreme Court accepts there was a torture chamber on the uh, 17th of December 2010 at the Miriana police station. He had inquired from another police officer Quote, Moun Kauda, who are they? Unquote. To which the other police officer replied, Quote, Sir, may I sergeant major ke case se ke eun? Sir, this is the parties involved in the sergeant major's case. Unquote. Such a loose reference to a matter alludes to the fact that not only did the fifth respondent have knowledge of the arrest of the petition and three others, but that he was kept updated on the events that transpired after the arrest on 15 December 2010. As such, it appears that the petitioner was kept detained without producing before a magistrate within the legally stipulated time frame with full knowledge of the fifth, fifth respondent. Therefore, I hold the fifth respondent too to have violated the fundamental rights of the petitioner enshrined under Articles 13.1 and 13.2 of the Constitution. While findings of the fundamental rights violations are ample, the wrongdoers, and he goes on to say, especially the big fish in the pond, are seldom held duly accountable. Senior officers under whose authority and directions their subordinates may act have a special duty to ensure that they do not abuse such authority or go beyond such direction. Senior officers cannot merely give orders and therefore thereafter sleep on this duty. They are to closely scrutinize the conduct of their subordinates. The stars that adorn their uniforms are not ornaments of power, but rather reminders of immense responsibility that comes with that authority. 
Remember, you have two more minutes. Right. I, you said we have. I have. I can take more time. Yeah, but uh, you already got. Uh... I is giving more time. Okay. Right. I want to reiterate this. The stars that adorn their uniforms are not ornaments of power, but rather reminders of the immense responsibility that comes with their authority. Gross neglect of this duty would render them complicit in the actions of their unduly subordinates, unruly subordinates. The concept of commission by omission is well recognized in our constitution jurisprudence by cases such as the Easter Sunday cases, Supreme Court FR 163, 2019, Supreme Court minutes of 12 January 2023. I am of the view that supervising officers are to be directly held liable for the conduct of their subordinates in appropriate instances, even in the absence of direct participation. Supervising officers can be held liable where there is affirmatory participation or participatory presence on the part of such supervising officers, or where they have directly or indirectly implemented or enabled unconstitutional policies by turning a blind eye towards unconstitutional practices directly under their authority. What is revealed to us in this instant case, apparent from what I have cited above from the affidavits, is a pattern of grave derelictions, which has persisted for a considerable period of time. Where such pattern is observable, observable what other inferences are we to draw then, draw then? Either the wrongdoings have taken place with the blessings of the direct supervisors, or that such supervisors have slept on the wheel. In either case, such supervision supervisors are directly complicit in the action so enabled. From the circumstances established in the instant case, it is clear that the fifth respondent has enabled through his actions as well as inaction the conduct, and conduct of the first, second and fourth respondents, making him directly liable for the fundamental rights violation herein before established. No material has been produced before this court by the fifth respondent so as to distance himself from such violations. Therefore, I hold the fifth respondent to have violated the fundamental rights of the petitioner guaranteed under 11, 12, 13, 1, 13, 2 of the Constitution. And I will end with this. Therefore, The fifth respondent is ordered to pay as compensation a sum of 500,000 rupees. The first, second, fourth and fifth respondents are to pay the aforementioned sums within six months from the date of judgment out of their personal funds. Now, I, why did I read this? I read it because it is on this matter that the Constitutional Council was split on the appointment of this Mr. W. W. Uh, e. D. Tenakon, also known as Desabandhu Tenakon, as the Inspector General of Police. In that instance, it is very clear that if there is not the exact amount of dissenting votes to those in agreement that the speaker has no role to play. Now, whether those members of the Constitutional Council should be asked to resign or not is a separate matter. Whether why they didn't vote or why they abstained is a separate matter. In fact, I brought it to the attention of the Minister of Justice and I said, if there is a conflict of interest in cases in the Supreme Court also, the justices recuse themselves. So there is no rule to say other than accepted practice or what is expected of them that they should either vote yes or no. Accepted practice coming from the 13th century and very specifically illustrated in Erskine May, also expected to be followed by the Honorable Speaker. So in this case, 
for the speaker to suggest that those people who abstain fall to either the eyes or the nays cannot be done. Abstinence means abstinence. It doesn't mean yes or no. I recall at one point when we were uh, being, uh, or there was a vote or the resolution, vote on a resolution in Geneva. And in favor of the resolution was a certain number. And against the resolution was another number. And then there were certain countries that abstained. And the government at the time added those numbers who abstained with the numbers that they received and said, we won the resolution. Or oh, actually, it was the other way around. The resolution was brought by someone else that we defeated the resolution, which was not the case. The United Nations didn't accept that position. So you see, it is a grave violation of the democratic rights of these people when the Constitutional Council was not willing to appoint a man found guilty by the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka of torture, of torture. Let us not talk about the torture of the Tamil people that happened then. How many Tamil people were tortured? Who talked about them? We tried to talk about them here. People who talked about that torture were killed. Whether it is uh, uh, journalists from a uh, 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 national newspaper or from a regional uh, uh, media. How many were killed trying to talk about torture? This is a single man. This is a single man. His name is Ranjit Sumangal. Right? I am not trying to make a distinction here between the torture of a single man and a Tamil man. But torture has continued to happen and these people have always been in office. It is a well-known fact that torture happens in the, in the police and that you hang people upside down. If you read this, and I'm going to table the 60 pages uh, written, uh, uh, the determination by, like I said, by uh, Justice Turayraja, Justice Vikramasinghe, and Justice Fernando, so that people in this country will know why the Constitutional Council, members of the Constitutional Council was opposed to the appointment of Mr. Uh, Tenakon as the, the Inspector General of Police. We cannot have a person who is found guilty of torture being the person in charge of the police. How can it be? How can it be, Mr. Chairman? How can it be? Where, 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 isn't this a democracy? Don't people have rights? And if they have been accused, that's another matter. You can say they have only been accused, they haven't been convicted. Here, this is a conviction. It is a conviction. So, purely on that matter, I have lost confidence in the speaker. I am sorry. I'm really sorry. It's not the man. It's the position. He wields so much power. And also we found out in this house during the debate that the Honorable Speaker didn't actually cast his casting vote at the Constitutional Council. He didn't. Mr. Kiriyala uh, specifically stated that. It was much later. He wrote to the Honorable President saying there is a 5 to 4 vote. So therefore, Mr. Chairman, there are many other issues that I wish to take up, but I'm in no mood to do so because this is not something I'm doing, this is not something I'm enjoying doing, right? This is something I don't enjoy doing, but I'm doing it because it has to be done, right? So it is on that basis and many others that I support this motion of no confidence 
against the Speaker of Parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable Douglas.